going to give a, a brief overview of our activities here, but during breakfast, the professor asked me, what else do I do? And so I thought it would be useful for us to see what all is abo um, below the responsibility of, of forestry, where the Stove Center is, um, but also to see some examples of what is this famous learning by doing that both the dean and the, the president referenced. Um, this is obviously where we've been having our dinner last night. And the tall tower here I use as my fire lookout tower during the fire season. So I have somebody up there with a the radio and uh, binoculars so that they can report any smokes that are happening in the valley. In the valley. Um, all the students spend three months with forestry. And work in the fields that they were talking about is physical labor. Okay, it's repairing roads, it's uh, clearing fire breaks, or it's doing regeneration. But it's learning by doing. And so everything is not just labor. It always is accompanied with uh, lectures and information about why we're actually doing those activities. Uh, it's hard work. Um, our probably favorite tool is Senor Machete. One of the students use this in this case for um, controlling weeds in one of our plantations. And the kids come in without much experience in labor. And so every student comes away from, from Zamorano with calluses on their hands. Okay. Um, here they're doing bark beetle control, fire line construction, reforestation, and sometimes they get tired. We also use them for the sustainable management of our forested lands. I'm responsible for 3,000 hectares, which includes the biological reserve. Um, our forests are managed sustainably, so we do do harvesting there. You'll see the sawmill later. Um, the students help us out doing the measurements for the management plan or the certification of our forests. Intermediate um, steps such as thinnings or prunings. And all of these presentations um, will be given to you guys on Saturday evening in a USB. So somebody taking a picture of the slide. Um, we do have a sawmill and in addition to primary breakdown, we also have the students go through and, and make furniture. And so our students are involved from seed, the nursery, the nursery through the management, the the control of, of insects, diseases, or weeds, um, harvesting, and then finally making uh, furniture. This is the field trip Saturday. Okay, this is where we'll be headed, those of you who select to go. It's a biologic reserve, as was mentioned several times, but it's also a cloud forest. And the difference between a cloud forest and regular forest is that 80% of the precipitation in this ecosystem is based upon condensation. And so the clouds come in, condense on the leaves, the water then drips down, and filtrates into the soil, and this then becomes our potable water source for Zamorano. Okay. Um, fires were mentioned several times. It's a big chunk of my life from January through June, where we construct over 70 kilometers of fire breaks, which you can see on the upper right-hand side. And we're on call 24-7. Um, this year was particularly bad. We had people set three fires within about two and a half hours, and we only had 24 people to, to deal with those. And so we did it within 24 hours. We had all three of the fires contained, but then they started putting fires at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night, where we don't have anybody up in the tower. And so we'd be up, get on the fire, midnight, work through the night, and then at 6.30 the next morning we'd have um, 30 students that we'd have to teach. Okay. Insects and diseases. Um, we also have problems with defoliating insects and bark beetles. Uh, those in the western United States are familiar with bark beetles and the disaster that's done in the Rocky Mountains and in Canada. We do a little bit better job controlling than you guys do. Okay. Um, this is probably one of the favorites for the students. This is where they're climbing the trees in order to control um, mistletoe, which is a hemi parasite. And mistletoe, even though it was a parasite, hemi parasite, it's probably one of the most famous parasites in the world because it's the mistletoe that people get a kiss underneath in, in Christmas time. I don't let the students kiss when they're on the tree. Okay. This is a project that we're doing on climate change. This is an oak species, Quercus oileoides, that grow, has its natural dis distribution from Mexico down through Costa Rica. And so we're collecting seeds from throughout that distribution uh, exchanging those seeds with other organizations, and then planting them under different irrigation treatments. 
And so some treatments have precipitation year round, the other treatments have the precipitation switched, and others have extra precipitation during the rainy season, and of course a control. And this is to allow us to identify if we do have precipitation changes here and we don't have natural regeneration in these ecosystems, where we can go get seeds so we don't lose the ecosystem. Finally, here we are at the Stove Center. Um, the Stove Center is designed um, primarily for social evaluation, although we do emissions testing as well. We're going to be building a new lab, which we'll talk about here in a second. But the Stove Center has six identical kitchens, which have two stove models installed in each one. Our objective is to provide information for governments, NGOs, other interested parties, because I know all we've had, I'm sure all of you guys have had people come knock on your door and say, what's the best stove? And it depends. It depends upon what their objectives are. Are their objectives environmental? Are their objectives health? Are their objectives to have the person use the stove? And so we provide that information. It's one of the reasons why I was really pleased with the structure of the ISO um, standards, because it separates out the, the performance of those stoves. It's very similar to my kid's report card. My kid's report card has math, chemistry, English, Spanish, etc. Well, we'll throw art and gym in there as well. I really don't care if he does really well in art or gym, because he's never going to be a professional soccer player, and he's not going to be a professional artist. And so if he gets C's on that, I'm not going to care too much. But if he gets a C in, in math or chemistry, I'm going to be upset. And so separating out those performances um, in kind of a report card fashion, I think it's going to be much, much more useful for the governments, the NGOs, the donors, et cetera, to select a model that bet, best fits what their specific objectives are. Okay? So we do the evaluations of the proficiency emissions and safety. We do a lot of training in the center. Okay? We also do model and technician certification for Honduras and the social compatibility, which we'll talk quite a bit more on. So we use the famous water boiling test, which everybody knows. And, and these are the types of things that we can show people. These are six different stove models across the bottom, the traditional Husta, 2x3, O'Neill, etc. And so if somebody wants a stove that boils water really quick, maybe they'll go with the Pazzari, or the model of Pazzari that we have installed. Which, Victor, did you bring me the components of the? You did? Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, you go with the Pazzari because according to this evaluation, it boiled the water quicker than the other models. But if you were concerned in use of fuel or microparticulates, then perhaps the Inkawatsi would be one of the better options for, for your particular objectives. Okay. We also do controlled co cooking tests, which we'll do tomorrow. We have a couple of ladies coming in from one of the local communities to help us out with the controlled cooking test in one of the stations. KPT is one of our big ones. Um, we get a lot of requests from organizations to go out and do KPT because they want to find out what exactly is the impact of their project um, in a given community. And so we go out and do the baseline evaluation. We've extended it out to five days instead of the three that's in the normal protocol because there's a lot of variability. For example, if people are boiling beans one day, which usually those beans will last for the week, uh, it'll skew the results if you just happen to have those three days when they're boiling beans. One of the th interesting things that we found out is that there's a, more cases than you would expect where people continue to use the same amount of wood. And so there's not a great reduction as you would expect. And after seeing that and then going back and talking with the ladies, it dawned on us that it's very similar to if I have a, a V8 vehicle and I'm spending $100 a, a week on gasoline, and then all of a sudden I buy a new vehicle that has much, much better gas efficiency, I still have the $100 budgeted, so I'm just going to drive more. And so what they do is they use the stoves more, but for additional tasks like boiling water, um, which they hadn't done previously. Okay. We've done some work on, on T loads, on microgasification. A lot of the work that we do do is contracted out by specific organizations. It's one of the reasons why um, Rainey's always hounding me about sharing our data that we've done in the past. And it's because organizations, companies from Mexico or or here in Honduras or Guatemala, pay us to do the evaluation. 
and because they're paying us, the data is theirs. Um, if they give us the green light, we can share that data, but if they don't give us the green light, it's confidential between us and them. When we can do um, research where it's open to the public is involving the fourth year students, the senior students, when they do their thesis project. And so this is an example of a student of ours from Bolivia who did his, his research, his thesis project on microgasification and the results that we got with the PCOP compared with the Inkawatsu. Okay, and this is just in carbon dioxide. You can see significantly less. Um, this is using corn cobs. These are using small pine sticks. And this is using um, shavings from pine. And so you can see that the, the emissions in dio carbon dioxide were significantly reduced. <coughs> we also did a, uh, this is Luis uh, Gamero from Peru, or yeah, from Peru, who did his thesis project on briquettes um, using some of uh, Richard Stanley's presses and technologies. And it looked fairly promising in terms of um, time to boil, um, performed quite well. But when we looked at some of the emissions, particularly the carbon monoxide and microparticulates, um, we came out with significantly higher um, emissions, carbon monoxide, than compared with your tr just traditional firewood. What kind of stones? This we used a three stone. And the reason that we used a three stone is because of the importance of, of manipulating the briquettes. If it would have been in a traditional stove, for example, and a briquette on the back fell off, it would have just sat there and smoldered. There was no way for us to be able to bring that back into the fire to make sure it had good combustion. Um, you'll see in the lab that we're not really set up the way that we want it to be. Um, we are planning a new laboratory that's going to have a portion of the roof much taller than the other, and that's to ac accommodate the chimney stoves. Okay. Um, originally, we had it planned to be a little bit bigger than this. We had a, a, another lab over here for welding. For financial purposes, budgetary purposes, that wing has been eliminated, and this portion has been eliminated. And so we're going to be having just this portion here that gives us a large area for um, storing the stoves. The stoves are generally custom built or fairly large because they involve a plancha. And so we'll be moving those into the laboratory with a hand truck for doing the evaluation. This is going to be our hood. And yes, I stole this slide directly from Jim's presentation last year. And the reason I stole this slide is because we're also going to steal the design. Okay? And so this is going to, and so this is going to have, as we all, those of you who are in North Carolina, a large tall hood for chimney stoves. The chimneys will be taken in with a hand truck on a pallet and then taken through the sampling ducts. And for um, leakage or fugitive emissions, we'll have a smaller hood that's then inserted into it to get the exposure measurements. The only disadvantage of this is that we're going to have to double our replications. Currently, when somebody brings a stove model to be evaluated, we ask them to bring or install three stoves of the same model, and we do a minimum three replication of each of those stove models. And so for one series, given that we don't have problems with deviations, um, at least nine replications per stove model, now since we're going to have one test with overall emissions, three replications for three models, and three replications for three models for exposure. It's going to double to 18, at least 18 uh, evaluations per stove. As I mentioned, um, all students, second year students or sophomores, spend a week in the stove center where we talk to them about design principles, construction, and evaluation protocols. But we also do social training. This was using or giving training to the Honduran um, army. A lot of these soldiers spend two years in the military and then leave for something else. And so we found that it's a good way for them to spread their knowledge into these local rural communities. But you gotta make sure your karma's good. And so to maintain our karma, we also do training of the Peace Corps. And so we've had groups from Throughout Latin America, in fact, we had the regional 
um, leaders of Latin America here for a week-long training session in stoves. Um, had training for the Honduran Peace Corps before they left the country and are currently working with the Nicaraguan Peace Corps. The problem with them is they always want to fix it. You can have a really good improved stove and they always think that they can always make it better. And so one of the things that we always try and communicate with them is that it's a, kind of like a carburetor. You wouldn't open the hood of your car and start screwing with the screws of your carburetor, would you? And I say, no. Well, why not? Because it would affect the efficiency. Well, yeah, if you change the dimension of these stoves of people who have worked with the design for a long time, and you start messing with stuff, it's going to affect the efficiency. And so we always talk with them about trying to... Ah, and the other thing, you have to teach them how to make, mix cement by hand. Um, we... Um, participate in a lot of national festivals um, where we're invited in to talk about improved stoves and coverage with the television and all that stuff. Okay. We, <laughs> um, we've held two stove camps based upon the approvacial model where we invite people, actors from throughout the region to come and uh, do different activities, share a week of much the same as we're doing here experiences, but more in stove design. And we had one on rocket stoves in 2010 and one in 2011 on microgasification. Um, Sam came for the rocket one. And then Krista Roth, I don't know if you know Krista, she came for the T-LUD along with Paul Anderson. Okay. Larry Winiarski came to our rocket stove. And just some results of playing with stuff for a week. But I always tell people that you can have the best stove in the world zero emissions or very low emissions, great efficiency, but if the woman won't use it, it's not worth anything. And we had an organization, NGO, come in to call me and said, Ingenier, we're going to do a project in this part of the country. What stove should we use? And I don't know. It depends on the woman. If I want to go, if I want to buy my wife a pair of shoes, okay, I'm going to use my criteria or her criteria. Her criteria, if, if, I want, if, if I want to sleep in bed that night. And so what we do is invite them to bring women into the stove center and prepare a meal. And I've got a short video I'm going to show you on this whole process. And then later we're going to be talking about it in more detail tomorrow morning. But before, thank you. Thank you. So the idea is that they split up in groups of two, um, each pair trying a different stove model. And so one group may be cooking beans, another group cooking a rice, another tortillas. And then as they share that lunch um, with the ingenieros, um, they talk about what things they liked and didn't like about each stove model. And here in a second, we'll see how we kind of have that structure. Yeah.
So what we use is kind of like the pain scale, where they assign different happy faces. Oh, they're all happy about this one. They're still deciding if they're happy or not. Or not so happy faces, depending upon the different components. Okay, smoke in the kitchen, um, safety of their children, um, how quickly it heats, how they like the plancher, the metal plate. So that then we can go through and quantify, ooh, they're very unhappy about that one. We can go th through there and, and quantify and find out for this community, um, which is the stove model that they seem to prefer. And you may or may not have noticed it, but they were the same stove models, but different results depending upon where those people come from. So with that as an introduction, um, what we're going to do now is go for a walk. Um, Ingeniero Flores is going to go in front. I'm going to go in my vehicle with the professor and anybody else who wants a ride. I can only take four people. But what we're going to do is go out through the parking lot of Kellogg, go through the tunnel by where we had lunch, cross the dirt road, and then walk down through an arboretum, arboretum and then go by Agri Industry, which is where we have the milk processing plant, uh, the slaughterhouse and the meat processing, and then up a little trail to when we get to the stove center. She's going to be leading. She walks really fast, <laughs> and so you want to keep up with it. We are going to be coming back here after, after lunch. lunch yeah. And also, one thing to really keep in mind here is, and one of the reasons why we thought this was, besides the beautiful facility, is integrating the users and the cooks into the into the lab that they're doing the laboratory testing and looking at some of the field testing and the user preferences as as a part of all of their activities together. The other reason why I'm specifically pleased, especially pleased, that Rainey selected here was because you'll see that um, we're starting out from. I mean, we got stuff there. We got PEMS. Um, we've got the LEMS temporarily hung up. But for those of you who have experience in setting up your labs and designing your laboratories, um, please share your experiences with us so that we can learn from your experiences and successes. And we'll, we'll be, have Tim sit up here and then he'll get all of your feedback and experiences. So as you do the walkthrough, think about what, what feedback recommendations and questions you have for Tim.